Well, um, thank you for the invitation for flying me uh, across, literally across the world. I'm not sure if I could have gone to a, a more far-flung uh, um, space. Obviously, I'm a bit jet-lagged, so I'll, I'll be a little bit more scattered than usual. Um, I'm actually not a good speaker, though. So I use that as an excuse when I'm traveling. I'm like, oh, you know, I'm all over the place. But I'm really just generally this incoherent um, at home, too. Um, so in the United States today, I guess the real question that people are, are debating is, is there kind of a shift to the left or a shift to the, the right? And the optimists among us can point to the growth of left groups like DSA and the far more significant support for uh, Bernie Sanders. So 13 million people voted for Bernie Sanders in the primary. Uh, many more indicated their support for him in the caucuses and, and other things too. Um, and of course, the more dour among us uh, can remind everyone that the right is emboldened. And of course, Trump was the one who actually won the 2016 um, election. Uh, I think suffice to say, we could just take a less definitive approach and just say that this is a period in which establishment politics have proven themselves bankrupt for a lot of people, and people are looking for alternatives, or and slash or are just kind of dropping out of, of engaging and doing the things that you normally do, like vote for the Democratic Party or, or turn out uh, for, for elections. Um, and you know, it's, a, it's really a time when the norms that have stood for decades are eroding. And the outcome, whether it'll benefit the right primarily or the, or the left primarily, is still undetermined, uh, which I think is at the very least um, uh, a situation that's better than the situation in some parts of Europe, for example, where it's pretty clear at this point that the populist right is in the driver's seat and is the prime beneficiary of the last 10 years. I think in the US, things are more um, indeterminate. So to begin with, it's worth pointing out that Trump doesn't really have a, a mandate. Uh, I feel like I'm, I'm doubling down and sticking to my guns because I, I, I swore to um, even a few people in the room uh, before the 26 election, 2016 election that uh, Trump uh, only had like a 1% chance of winning. Um, and, I, and I don't think I discredited myself. I think I was correct. Just, you know, 1% isn't 0%. Isn't <laughs> um, and, but, but he won by the narrowest of margins. He kind of fluked his way in the White House, partially on the basis of just a very Byzantine, um, unusual um, uh, you know, electoral system that we have in the US. And his support has actually continued to erode ever since. He's constantly in battle with not just the media and, and all the other kind of cultural apparatuses stacked against him, but, but also there's a real you know, popular base of people that just that don't, don't like him, um, even, even people that aren't uh, I don't identify themselves with the left in any, in any way or shape. And I think it didn't necessarily have to be this way. Uh, Trump's position coming out of the 2016 election was a contradictory one. And he's resolved things in a way that shouldn't bring some relief to those of us on the left. So in other words, he had to try to reconcile the populist promises of his campaign. Uh, for example, um, promises for infrastructure spending, his criticism of the established a kind of post-war U.S. order, which was linchpin by two things in particular, um, a, a network of kind of free trade arrangements and also uh, U.S. support for NATO. Um, so he seemed to be challenging some of those things during his campaign, but he had to reconcile uh, the more populous and more unusual parts of his campaign with the traditional business interests that Republicans uh, rely on, which are, of course, you know, free trade, they wanted tax cuts, they were very wary of deficit spending, um, and so on. So you could say that there was a battle between the Steve Bannon kind of right populist wing of the Republican Party and the Paul Ryan one. And Bannon has since been removed from the administration and uh, Trump's crowning achievement is uh, tax cuts. So the few tariffs, by the way, that he recently slapped on uh, to the um, uh, tariffs on um, imported steel and aluminum, um, these aren't very popular, um, and also in general, I mean, just because the issue can be confusing, like free uh, trade is sometimes good and in the interest of workers. Um, sometimes in certain contexts, certain forms of protectionism might be too, but this is a particularly um, kind of useless and not very and counterproductive at, in any standpoint um, um, form of uh, uh, you know, action that has very little support among either unions uh, ordinary people or, um, or business interests. Um, so there was a real danger, though, that, that even though the Trump wasn't elected with a wide base, 
Um, you know, he relied on actually a base that was very much like a lot of traditional um, uh, right of center uh, governments. I mean, a lot of them were, were kind of petty bourgeois, you know, it was, it was a very white base, but it was still like a, a middle class base. So in other words, sometimes in the media, your popular depiction of what an average Trump voter would look like might be like just a, um, a downtrodden, kind of slightly embittered um, uh, white worker. But it's more likely like a like middle manager at a hardware store or something. Um, uh, and, and he was really elected because a lot of the people that traditionally turned out to vote for the Democrats didn't turn out to vote for Hillary Clinton. Um, so black and Latino workers um, in, in particular turnout was down and, and there was some, some actually uh, attrition, some, some limited uh, uh, support. So Democrats have been predicting that, that you know, historic levels of, of black support for Obama would be slightly, turnout would be down in the, the black, black community, but they thought it would be made up for in, um, uh, among Latinos. It, it wasn't. Um, uh, a lot of uh, white workers that voted for Obama twice um, did not vote for Hillary Clinton. Of course, the reason given to the media for this is that they're racist. Um, and, you know, um, but there was really the chance that Trump could have developed the base through things like a uh, deficit uh, uh, spending fueled uh, jobs program, for instance. So, you know, Bannon's line was, you know, money, with, money is cheap. You could just borrow a bunch of money from, from China, create a big jobs and infrastructure program. And he thought that that would yield you know, support, even among a minority communities that traditionally don't vote Republican. Uh, so I guess what Bannon was factoring in was that you know, uh, the level of if Trump's support in the black community is like 20, less than 20 percent. Um, if that even got up to 30 percent on the basis of just you know, giving uh, deprived communities access to uh, employment uh, through a jobs program, you know, that would be enough to really take a coalition that's like 44, 45 percent and make it into a majoritarian uh, one, which is actually, I think, smart. And we should rebel against parts of the left's um, almost essentialism that just assumes that because of demographic facts, you know, young people or, or people of color or whatnot, that they'll never vote for a uh, right of center uh, candidacy. And especially in an era when uh, center left uh, parties aren't really offering people anything constructive or positive or useful. You know, that's always a danger. Uh, luckily for us, um, the um, Trump administration has just pursued basically the business part of the uh, Republican um, agenda. So he's chose Paul Ryan, not Steve Bannon. He's just done so in a very unusual way, you know, very like, kind of gaff prone way, a way with, you know, he's away with words, as, as people, people know. Um, though it's not quite as unusual as people think. Um, I grew up in, in New York and I have a lot of friends from Queens who kind of have, have some Trumpism. Like everything's amazing and you know, you know it's, it, it's not that unusual. Um, so so I, I, think, I think it's hard to imagine today, given the way things are going, given how low Trump's approval ratings are, historically low, it's hard to imagine a more favorable condition for resistance but you know we shouldn't underestimate the ability of U.S. liberalism to snatch um, you know, defeat from the jaws of uh, victory. Uh, so the, the the Democratic Party, um, it's worth noting, isn't really a, a party in a traditional sense um, that we um, we see parties emerge in like in in, in other other countries. So there's, it's not a membership based organization. Um, primaries in the U.S. are conducted by the state. Um, if I decided tomorrow to become a Republican, I could start a, um, you know, say I'm a communist Republican, and it would be literally impossible for the Republican Party to um, kick me out. Like, it would actually, the only way if I was disenfranchised, um, just generally, but by the, by the state. Um, so it's not a party that calls protests, uh, as unusual as that, that is. So Hillary Clinton is, is like kind of the leader of, uh, you know, a hashtag resistance. But uh, she's not speaking on the streets. You know, it's not, um, there was no, I mean, it's a, it's a telling thing that she won the popular vote by, uh, by millions of votes, but there was no kind of rallies on the streets calling for her to be um, uh, instituted as, as, as president. You know, there was, there was none, of, um, uh, none of that. Uh, but, you know, things like the, the Women's March were a promising start to the Trump era. 
uh, millions were participating uh, in that march and, and in kind of surrounding events that never engaged in mass politics before. And it was truly you know, spontaneous to begin with. Um, but even though the initial leadership was, was organic, due to the structure of US politics, the polls from the beginning were in a kind of NGO direction uncritical of the Democratic Party in general and Clinton in particular. So in other words, I'm not saying that these movements were kind of created from the top of the Democratic Party. I think they were very much organic, but just given our party structure, given what politics are in the US, they just kind of naturally drifted in this direction. On the other hand, there was also the, the airport protests and, and all these other kind of spontaneous movements in defense of um, um, immigration rights and refugees and whatnot. Um, these followed the more classic dilemma of good spontaneous movements, but without kind of an or, a coherent organizational um, whole, you know, uh, you can't really sustain struggle and, and, and you know, continue it on. So that's a common, uh, you know, common story, of course, um, everywhere around the world. But, you know, there seemed to be, at the very least, some, a real realization, uh, even among uh, established Democratic Party, that things had to change. Uh, there was a quote. Uh, by one prominent Democratic uh, Party official right after the election, and he said, if you want to appeal to the uh, manufacturing worker in Scranton, um, you know, a kind of industrial or formerly industrial area in, in Pennsylvania, the college student in Los Angeles, and the single mom making minimum wage in Harlem, one economic message will work. You know, that, that was what the Democratic Party was saying, and it came from Chuck Schumer, a New York senator who's basically known as like the most kind of opportunist person in the party. Like he's a right wing figure in the party, but now he's saying things like that. But he's a good bellwether of the way the broader climate because he'll kind of move in, in, any, in any direction. Um, but it's a far cry from what he was saying just two months before the election. And this was his quote, for every blue collar Democrat we lose in Western Pennsylvania, we will pick up two moderate Republicans in the suburbs in Philadelphia. And you could repeat that in Ohio, Illinois, and Wisconsin. Uh, so this is literally the same person two months, two months apart. Um, so the Democratic Party, you know, we don't have time to go into this, the structure of it, but it's a social liberal party, but with labor within a, its tent. So U.S. politics is basically what, um, let's say, U.K. politics would be like if um, the liberals maintain uh, their hegemonic, you know, kind of position, and instead the independent. Um, well, I, you guys are from Australia. I don't know why you, I think that you would, it would be more relevant for me to bring up an example of UK politics. I'll just move on. But it's a social liberal, not a social democratic um, uh, party. You know, I see your flag. You have the Union Jack on it, you know. Um, so for a while, though, after the, 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 in the post-war period, just like a lot of uh, social democratic parties abroad, the Democrats could promise workers a fair share of a growing pie. But with the resolution of the crisis in the 1970s, at best what they could do is marry social inclusion with neoliberalism. So like in my family, for instance, we all vote, like literally everyone in a very large extended uh, family, 50 people, all 50, you know, are vote Democrat because the Republicans are kind of have this, um, you know, this white nationalist mystique to it. It really is like a, 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 um, a very, hard right party for a center right party of, 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 of government. Um, so it has something, there's been some advances, of course, in, in, in social struggles and the struggle against racism and all these other things. And the Democratic Party has been able to speak to those changes and kind of um, uh, obviously push by social movements, you know, adopt progressive views on certain social issues. But it's been marrying this rhetoric of, of social inclusion and diversity with essentially neoliberal politics not too different than uh, the Republican uh, Party. You know, just like a lot of center-left parties and you know, centrist parties, the Democrats are just basically saying, you know, we'll cut less um, than the alternative. Or it'll be death by kind of a, a thousand small cuts instead of one big um, offensive. Now, Bernie Sanders offered an alternative model. And you could look at Bernie Sanders' program and say, oh, this is just a social democratic program. The reason why it was different, it was kind of a class struggle social democracy. It was based on an antagonism. His message was very simple to people. It's, you know, you work hard and you deserve more. And the reason why you don't have enough isn't because of um, immigrants or minorities or other scapegoats. It's because of millionaires and billionaires. So the classic rhetoric there is, is you know, it's, it's a rhetoric that you would expect from someone who was first politicized through the socialist movement, um, who, who has that, um, that, that background. 
And even some Democrats, like I quoted Schumer before, I thought that even if this wasn't politically desirable, then at the very least it was a viable political route to rebuild the party. So it was a classic, you know, many of them wanted to do the classic thing that center left parties elsewhere in the world do is, you know, when you're in opposition, you attack, uh, you, attack, uh, you know, left. Um, but then, you know, over time, this kind of uh, resistance to Trump um, and, you know, uh, we'll use that scare quotes around it half the time, um, began blaming kind of uh, its own scapegoats like the role of the FBI in the election, which is fine, you know, fair, uh, FBI, uh, you know, is, 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 a, is a terrible institution. Um, and um, especially now Russia. And every, so everything has kind of devolved in this very like legalistic um, constitutional um, uh, mode. So uh, multiple people have made the comparisons with Italy and it kind of, uh, that kind of failed um, resistance against, um, against Berlusconi was very much moved in this legalistic way. It tried to use portions of the media against him. And he himself, you know, governed basically like a, a, a traditional uh, right-wing, you know, neoliberal, but with like a level of buffoonery. So it actually fits well on both, both, um, both sides. So I do think, um, and I will double down, you know, in 2020, I think Trump will be defeated. 99.5% chance this time. Um, but even if this tactic, this kind of anyone but Trump, this kind of anti-Trump rhetoric is enough to defeat the candidate Donald Trump in, in 2020, it won't be enough to defeat Trumpism. And I don't think Trumpism is necessarily an ideology of the far right, but you could be worried about the rise of a far right once this populist right governing uh, uh, movement is, is out of power. You can imagine the forces that it'll, it'll unleash. Um, so I'll, I'll just wrap up by with a few glimmers of hope uh, on, the, on the left, and I'll let Jeff um, kind of elaborate you know, more. Um, there's, of course, DSA, uh, when I joined a, a decade ago, it had 5,000 members and a medium age in the 60s. Uh, it's now had its median age, and it has uh, 35,000 uh, members. And I think that's of interest to the left, but at the moment, um, it's you know, generally still a fringe development in a country of 330 uh, million, million people. Uh, but we shouldn't underestimate how much mobilizational capacity even small groups on the left can have in eras where unions and mass parties have been hollowed out. So in other words, uh, with two, 3,000 members in New York City, uh, DSA can mobilize more people at a protest than a, than a, a trade union of um, you know, 60, 70,000 um, uh, people. Um, so more importantly, uh, I'll let Jeff you know, get into this, uh, is the recent upsurge of uh, public sector unionism, particularly in areas like West Virginia and Oklahoma. Uh, these um, Coincidentally, our areas are not coincidentally, our areas with um, weak trade union bureaucracies. Uh, the West Virginia strike was a illegal wildcat strike, so it's quite unprecedented. Uh, socialists uh, did play a role within that strike. Um, and there are attempts through DSA, through what the ISO and others are doing to build this kind of militant minority that we need uh, uh, through um, cadre building and then strategic interventions. It's obviously a little bit of a different um, it's a little bit different how we have to approach it within DSA because it's a, uh, an organization that anyone could just join online. So we kind of have to find people and create you know, institutions and politics within this more amorphous you know, uh, tent. So it's, it's a different thing, but, but you know, similar aim. Um, there's consensus on some parts of DSA and the wider left that you know, a lot of the focus for us should be on uh, K through 12 education workers, um, on nurses, um, on logistics workers, um, on the first two fronts, especially among teachers, but also some degree in the nurses' unions, there's been a lot of progress. The logistics thing is just something we um, say and need to put into you know, practice, but it does seem like a strategic sector for, for the future. But you know, West Virginia, I think, was a you know, vindication of, of worker struggle at the disruptive core of left politics. Um, these are people positioned with the social weight to lead a wider transformation. So of course, everybody in a moral and ethical sense have social value, but for those of us in you know, professions like journalism or students or whatnot, what we do by nature, um, we're less strategic for the, for the left because we have a, a much smaller disruptive capacity. And uh, this used to be common sense across all forms of the left from reformists to revolutionary left, um, even a few decades ago, and it's kind of been, been lost. And I think these strikes are always periodic reminders of what just you know, 10, 20,000 people can do reshaping the politics of an entire state. Um, 
And, and you know, um, and finally, you know, I'll, I'll wrap up by saying that, you know, today Bernie Sanders' dance is, is becoming a little bit more um, iffy. And I say this as the biggest uh, Bernie Sanders, you know, apologist um, on the broad left, even even among like your average R revolution type. You know, I say no no bad words about Bernie Sanders. But he's still the most popular politician in the country. Uh, health willing, he will be running in 2020. Uh, but he's been forced to ingratiate himself with the democratic establishment. He's aping certain kinds of rhetoric. And it's less because he's trying to position himself so much as there was a void. And he's now just seen as like a, even though he's not technically in the Democratic Party, he's seen as kind of the leadership or part of the leadership of a wing of the Democratic Party. And that, that does mean that that he might may be losing the anti-establishment appeal that he once had. That's just my guess for 2020. If you look at polling, his favorability is as high as, 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 as ever. There's a lot of um, efforts like Our Revolution and a lot of other efforts among these kind of Bernie Kratz. Uh, these are more electoral um, efforts to kind of uh, elect um, like liberal left city council people and, and other seats. I think the stance of the left should be to not combat or even necessarily um, directly, you know, criticizes and you should not be doing this, but to kind of stay on the outside of these, these efforts. Um, but I, I would just say that, you know, uh, West Virginia does and, and uh, the, you know, um, struggles to come um, in Oklahoma and, and elsewhere uh, are the most significant developments in the labor movement in a generation. And they show where our orientation primarily should be, and that's within the labor movement um, um, in, in particular, because the labor movement is not just another uh, social movement. You know, it's, it's the foundation of core of, of any working class politics. And I really think there's going to be uh, a way forward uh, shown in the next few months through these uh, upsurges.